Hi guys, so we're going to start the next part, which is how the heart regulates itself. If you were to ask someone to name a piece of equipment used by a doctor or nurse, one of the most common answers would likely be a stethoscope. Doctors and nurses use a stethoscope to listen to a patient's heart in nearly every visit. The sound a heart makes when it beats conveys critical information on the patient's heart health. In this chapter, you'll learn about the anatomy and physiology of the heart, including what to listen for in patients' heart sounds. As a healthcare professional, it's critical that you understand heart physiology so that you can locate and identify abnormal heart sounds. Auscultating or listening to the heart with a stethoscope should reveal two sounds during each heartbeat. These sounds are often described as lub-dub and are associated with the heart valve's closing. The basic rhythm of the heart sound is lub-dub, pause, lub-dub, and so on, with the pause indicating the period when the heart is relaxing. Understanding the rhythm of the heart will allow you to detect any abnormal heart sounds, which may indicate heart disease. For example, heart murmurs occur when blood backflows or regurgitates through a partially open valve after the valve is closed. In such a case, you will hear a swishing sound when you listen to the heart. By having a thorough understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the heart, you will be able to listen for and identify any abnormal heart sounds so that your patient can receive necessary treatment. Okay, and so the electrical events of the heart. The heart actually depolarizes and contracts without nervous system stimulation at all. The rhythm can be altered by the autonomic nervous, nervous system, but it's not initiated by it. And so basically the heartbeat setting this basic rhythm is due to the presence of cap gap junctions. So as we talked about earlier, there's this coordinated heartbeat. And basically it's initiated through what's called the intrinsic cardiac conduction system. And so this is a network of non-contractile, what's called autorhythmic cells. These are cells that are not contracting. They're communicating to the cells to tell them when to contract. They initiate and distribute impulses to coordinate depolarization and the, con the contraction of the heart. Now, basically, this intrinsic conduction system is initiated by what's called pacemaker cells. And pacemaker cells have unstable resting membrane potentials and these are called either pacemaker potentials or pre-potentials. And there's three parts to those. Um, basically, there's what's known as a pacemaker potential, the depolarization, and repolarization. So let's kind of look at a graph so we can talk about this. So number one is pacemaker potential. And so this, if you see, the resting membrane potential here is a little bit higher than what we see for um, nervous system cells. And basically the pacemaker potential is a slow depolarization. It's due to both opening of sodium channels and the closing of potassium. Notice at this point you never see that the membrane potential is a flat line. So here you're starting to see this positive um, change happening. Now the number two is depolarization. And basically the, you're gonna get this action potential to happen whenever you reach threshold. And so um, basically this potential reaches threshold and that's because um, calcium is um, coming in. And that happens um, basically threshold is right here at negative 40 millivolts. And then repolarization happens and this is basically because calcium channels inactivate. And so calcium can't flow anymore. <coughs> 
Um, on top of this, the potassium channels are opening. This allows potassium to leave, which brings the membrane potential back to this negative amount of around negative 60. And so this is constantly happening to um, activate um, the beginning of or to give the stimulus that it needs to essentially tell the cells to start um, firing. Now the cardiac pacemaker, pacemaker cells actually pass this impulse in order and it takes about 0.22 seconds for the total to happen. So it starts in this area, oops, sorry guys, called the sinoatrial node. This is also seen as the SA node. From there, it goes to the atrioventricular node. So this is SA node. This is known as the AV node. From here, it goes to the atrioventricular bundle or AV bundle. Then it branches off into both the right and left bundle branches. And then from there, it goes to the subendocardial conducting network. And this network is also known as the Purkinje fibers. So this is the um, this is the sequence of excitation starting in the SA node with the pacemaker cells and allowing the contraction or this impulse to go from the top area um, or that base all the way through to the apex. Let's take a closer look inside the heart. The yellow objects you see on the left are not nerves. They're actually specialized cardiac muscle cells in the walls of the heart. Their job is to send signals to the rest of the heart muscle and cause a contraction. Together, this group of cells is called the cardiac conduction system. The main components of the cardiac conduction system are the SA node, AV node, bundle of his, bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers. Let's follow a signal through the contraction process. The SA node starts the sequence by causing the atrial muscles to contract. That's why doctors sometimes call it the anatomical pacemaker. From there, the signal travels to the AV node, through the bundle of his, down the bundle branches, and through the Purkinje fibers, causing the ventricles to contract. This signal creates an electrical current that can be seen on a graph called an electrocardiogram, or EKG. Doctors use an EKG as a way of seeing how well the cardiac conduction system works. Any changes to the EKG can mean serious problems. So basically, the intrinsic conduction system starts with the um, sinoatrial node, or the SA node. Um, pacemaker of the heart is in the actual right atrial wall, and it generates impulses at about 75 times per minute. And so this is what's known as sinus rhythm. The impulse is going to spread across the atria into basically to the AV node. And so if we were looking at this, and oops, it would be about 75 beats per minute is how active that the sinoatrial node is. The atrioventricular node, or AV node, is in the inferior intraatrial septum. And basically, this delays the impulse approximately 0.1 seconds. And so this allows, so if you notice, it delays it, right? And this guy, it goes at about 50 
beats per minute. And basically, the inherent rate of this is 50 times per minute in the absence of the SA node. So this basically makes sure, this delays it to make sure that the atrial contraction is prior or happens before the ventricular contraction. If we were pushing the whole heart out at one time, basically you wouldn't be able to get the, the ventricles completely filled so that you can use all of your might to push everything out in there each time. You'd be only filling it halfway or so, or even less than that. So we need this delay to help completely fill those ventricles so all the power and all the um, muscle force that you're putting into it actually pays off with movement of fluid. Next, we're going to go to the atrioventricular AV node, which is also um, known as the bundle of His. This is the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles, right? So this is located in the superior intraventricular septum. There's no gap junctions between the, a, um, the um, atrium and ventricle. So this is the only way that the two parts of the heart can communicate. Now from there, it goes through the right and left bundle branches. There's two pathways that um, basically in that intraventricular septum and it carries impulse towards the apex of the heart. And then the last part is the subendocardial conduction network, which is also referred to as the become G fibers. Um, basically, this is a complete pathway through the intraventricular septum into the apex and the ventricle walls. It's more elaborate on the left side, and that would be because you have the left ventricle here, right? And so this part right here only works at about 30 beats per minute. So this actually can act as a pacemaker under certain conditions. So let's look at this process here and where it is. And so over here is the action potential in the shapes. And over here, we're gonna look at the anatomy. So as you can see, the SA um, node, the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker, in, um, kind of um, generates impulse here in the atrium. And you can see here that this is the pacemaker potential. You kind of have it come here, and it increases and goes down. Right? Um, next, you can see it's going to radiate here through the atrium into this guy right here, which is the atrioventricular AV node. This is going to be slightly delayed. So if you see contraction is here, it comes up and then it starts moving. So it's slightly behind. It's delayed by 0.1 seconds to make sure that the, um, when it moves the information onto the ventricle, that the atrium is already finished contracting. And then it's going to go down through the AV bundle or the atrioventricular bundle, also known as the bundle of His, down this intraventricular septum, right? It's been delayed a bit. So you can see here when they contract, it's going to be slightly past all of this because it's going to take some time to get down there. It's going to divide into the two bundle branches so then they can go to the different sides of the heart, both the left and the right. And 
Once it gets down here, these are what are known as Purkinje fibers at the end of the subendocardial um, conducting network. And basically on here, it's going to have more elaborate on the left side again. Um, the whole process here takes about um, 0.22 seconds for it to go through. And you can see this is the actual um, ventricular contraction. So it's gonna contract down here with the ventricle muscles at the end. So there are external innervations of the heart. So the heart beat can be modified by the autonomic nervous system versus um, via cardiac centers and the medulla oblongata. So these are not consciously directed. These are unconsciously. And so you have cardiac accelerated centers and these send signals through the sympathetic trunk to increase heart rate. So this can stimulate the sinoatrial node and the avian ventricular nodes, the heart muscle and the coronary arteries. Now there are cardio inhibitory centers as well, and these are parasympathetic signals that um, go down via the vagus nerve to decrease rate. So these are gonna inhibit SA and AV nodes via the um, vagus nerve. So it's gonna decrease things like the lung, um, heart, and digestive system. And so you can see them here, the autonomic nervous system and the different parts. So, um, you can see here that you have the vagus nerve that's here, and this is going to help decrease the heart, and so it's going to act on both the SA and AV nodes here, right? So you're going to see decreased heart rate in those basically um, centers that are dealing with... Um, cardio inhibitory centers. And you'll see um, basically the um, sympathetic, these um, cardio accelerated centers, you can see um, this is the medulla oblongata um, area that essentially they are being modified from and so this goes down using an inner neuron into the sympathetic trunk area it comes out to the sympathetic ganglion and basically this is going to help increase heart rate and the force of contraction here and they act on both the AV and SA node as well so this cardiac inhibitor, this vagus nerve, is the rest and digest, right? And the sympathetic is the fight and flight response. So basically contractile muscle fibers make up the bulk of the heart and are responsible for the pumping action versus we were talking about pacemaker cells and um, basically conduction cells. They're different from skeletal muscle contractions. Cardiac muscle action potentials have plateaus. And so in this, basically what we look at is um, how the action potential is generated. So initially, Depolarization opens fast voltage-gated sodium channels, so sodium enters. So this has positive feedback because the more sodium that comes in and rises, the more they open. And so essentially you go from negative 90, when we're talking about these are different than the pacemaker, right? These are the contractile cells. So it goes from negative 90 millivolts to positive 30. From there, the depolarization of sodium will open slow calcium channels. So at positive 30, so sodium channels close, but slow calcium channels will remain open. So this prolongs that depolarization that happens. That's why we see a plateau. 
So normally what we have when we talk about these things is, you know, sodium channels close and then potassium channels open and then you start seeing the reduction in um, or the repolarization happening. Here though, sodium channels are gonna close, but calcium channels remain open. So because um, the positive charge is still moving, or um, the you don't have these positive charges leaving, you see this plateau happen. Somewhere after about 200 milliseconds though, slow calcium channels are closed, and then we have voltage-gated potassium channels are open. So this is where you're gonna get depolarization happening or repolarization happening. The calcium is pumped back in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and out of the cell into the extracellular space. So the difference between contractile muscle fibers and skeletal muscle fibers, the action potential in skeletal muscles lasts about one to two milliseconds. Where in cardiac, it's less than or it lasts for about 200 milliseconds. So cardiac muscle contraction is much longer. Um, or the action potential itself is much longer. Contractile and skeletal muscles last between 10 and 100 milliseconds, where in cardiac, it's longer again, lasting over 200 milliseconds. What's the benefit of longer um, action potentials and contractions? It makes sure that all the blood gets out of the ventricles right? And the longer refractory period means that you're not going to have um, tectonic contractions, right? So basically, you're going to have these really strong, efficient contractions to push all the blood out, then it relaxes and waits for the next. You're not going to have these kind of really short, ineffective contractions. And so let's compare the action potentials um, of contractile muscle cells. And so here, the very first you'll see, you'll start with this negative 90, and this, you're going to see this depolarization happening here. Because think, you're gonna have opening of sodium channels. And these are fast voltage gated sodium channels and it's positive feedback. So the more you open or the more positive it gets, the more you open. And so this is going to um, basically reverse this membrane potential really, really quite quick. Now, if you see, once you get up there, you have this plateau stage and this plateau is because even though at this point, sodium becomes activated, the calcium channels are still open. They're slow to close. This keeps the cell depolarized because potassium is not leaving yet. And this last, once you start seeing de, uh, repolarization happening, this is because the calcium is closed or basically, and they're not closed, they're inactive, and potassium now is open. So they're gonna go back. Now you can compare this to the amount of tension here. Here you'll see that tension is increasing. Here and going down. And so your tension is highest towards the end of this plateau because at this point you're getting maximum amount of action potential and then it slowly um, or quickly increases as the action potential fades. The cardiac conduction system consists of the following components. The sinoatrial node, or SA node, located in the right atrium near the entrance of the superior vena cava. This is the natural pacemaker of the heart. It initiates all heartbeat and determines heart rate. 
Electrical impulses from the SA node spread throughout both atria and stimulate them to contract. The atrioventricular node, or AV node, located on the other side of the right atrium near the AV valve. The AV node serves as electrical gateway to the ventricles. It delays the passage of electrical impulses to the ventricles. This delay is to ensure that the atria have ejected all the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. The AV node receives signals from the SA node and passes them onto the atrioventricular bundle, AV bundle or bundle of his. This bundle is then divided into right and left bundle branches which conduct the impulses toward the apex of the heart. The signals are then passed onto Purkinje fibers, turning upward and spreading throughout the ventricular myocardium. Electrical activities of the heart can be recorded in the form of electrocardiogram, ECG, or EKG. An ECG is a composite recording of all the action potentials produced by the nodes and the cells of the myocardium. Each wave or segment of the ECG corresponds to a certain event of the cardiac electrical cycle. When the atria are full of blood, the SA node fires, electrical signals spread throughout the atria and cause them to depolarize. This is represented by the P wave on the ECG. Atrial contraction, or atrial systole, starts about 100 milliseconds after the P wave begins. The PQ segment represents the time the signals travel from the SA node to the AV node. The QRS complex marks the firing of the AV node and represents ventricular depolarization. Q wave corresponds to depolarization of the interventricular septum. R wave is produced by depolarization of the main mass of the ventricles. S wave represents the last phase of ventricular depolarization at the base of the heart. Atrial repolarization also occurs during this time, but the signal is obscured by the large QRS complex. The ST segment reflects the plateau in the myocardial action potential. This is when the ventricles contract and pump blood. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization immediately before ventricular relaxation or ventricular diastole. The cycle repeats itself with every heartbeat. So electrocardiogram can detect electrical currents generated by the heart. In um, electrocardiograms, ECG or EKG is a graphic recording of this electrical activity. The composite of all action potentials are given time, not a tracing of a single um, action potential when we're looking at this. Electrodes are placed at various points on the body to measure voltage differences. And so there's typically 12 lead ECGs is the most typical. The electrocardiogram or ECG, is a recording of the heart's electrical activity via leads placed at standardized points on the subject's body. This animation shows how the different ECG waves are produced during a cardiac cycle. The P wave is produced as the electrical impulse travels through the atria, causing them to contract. The P wave corresponds to atrial depolarization. The impulse then travels through the atrioventricular node, producing a flat section on the ECG, known as the PR segment. The PR segment is flat because no current is flowing through the cardiac muscle cells. As the impulse travels from the AV node to the bundle of His and along the upper part of the septum, the Q wave is produced. The passage of the electrical signal through the ventricles produces a large spike called the QRS complex. The QRS complex is much larger than the P wave because the ventricles are much larger than the atria and so produce more electrical activity. Most of the QRS complex represents depolarization of the left ventricle, which has much greater mass than the right. The impulse remains unchanged for a moment as the ventricles remain depolarized. This gives rise to another flat section called the ST segment. 
As the impulse fades away and the ventricles repolarize, the T wave is formed. Note, this animation shows the ECG recorded from a lead placed at position V6, one of the standard electrode positions to the left of the heart. Leads at other positions detect the electrical activity of the heart from a different point of view and therefore produce differently shaped ECGs. As you will see, during atrial fibrillation, the electrical activity of the atria becomes disorganized. As a result, there is no P wave on the ECG of a patient in atrial fibrillation. The absence of P waves is one of the most important features used to diagnose atrial fibrillation. Okay, so let's talk about this ECG trace. So you can see there's a bunch of different main features. And so this very first feature that we see here, this P wave. Essentially, the P wave is the depolarization of the SA node. Right? And so this is going to represent um, atrial depolarization. Now, as you notice through here, you have this PR interval. And because you can see that it kind of goes down here. So this PR interval here is essentially the beginning of, so you get atrial um, excitation to begin ventricle excitation. Right? So this is depolarization. The P is depolarization of the SA and node in the atria. And then this time lag here, this interval, is when the atria is actually going to become excited. And then you're going to go down here where the QRS complex here. And basically this is when you're getting ventricular depolarization, and at the same time during this, you're getting atrial repolarization. Now, if you notice that this spike in A is much bigger than the depolarization in the atria for P here because the ventricle is much larger. Now, if this R is bigger, then what it should be, it can help us kind of tell that there could be a problem with the ventricle being enlarged. Now, if you notice here, you're going to have this, what's known as the QT interval down here. And this is the interval that you're going to start seeing that essentially is that it's the beginning of ventricle depolarization, right? And so you get ventricle depolarization there through ventricle repolarization. So all of this, because ST segment here is when the ventricle myocardium is depolarizing, right? So you get the actual ventricle depolarizing. And then here you're going to get from that action, the mitocardium actually depolarizing for contraction. And then through this QT, you're looking at the activation of the ventricle through depolarization the con and us looking at it being um, essentially contracted and then on T is the repolarization of the ventricle. Now if the ST, that's a different color, if this ST segment is altered, say it's elevated, 
it can basically say, or if it's depressed, it's altered in any way, right? It can be an indication that you have um, cardiac ischemia. If the QT interval is prolonged or abnormal, this would um, indicate that you have abnormal repolarization and basically ventricular arrhythmias can form. So it's very easy to look at these ECG tracings and find out if they're problems with the heart. And so this is just again showing the sequence. So here you're seeing atrial in this P, atrial polarization. It's initiated here in this um, atrium at the SA node. And so it's causing the P wave. This part right here is the atrial um, depolarization that's complete. And at that point, it's being delayed at the AV node. Once you get this Q, RS complex, this is where the ventricle is becoming depolarized as it goes down the bundle of Hiss in those um, bundle branches or the um, atrioventricular bundles down to the end, right? And so it basically the ventricle um, is going to begin or the depolarization begins at the apex causing the QRS complex, and then atrial depolarization is happening at the top at the same time. When you get the small line that comes out, this is ventricular depolarization is complete, and you're going to get contraction. After a while, the um, T wave is talking about ventricular repolarization begins at the apex going up, and that's going to cause the T wave. And then once this is completely repolarized, it's seen in here. So changes in patterns or timings of ECGs may reveal disease states as are or damaged hearts or a problem with the heart conduction. So problems can be detected, like we said, if you have an enlarged R wave, it may indicate enlarged ventricles. Elevated or depressed ST segments indicate cardiac ischemia. Prolonged QT intervals can reveal a depolarization abnormality that can risk um, or cause an increase in the risk of ventricular arrhythmias. Or you can get junctional blocks, blocks, flutters, fibrillations are all also detected on ECGs. And so this is showing you kind of um, basically an infant undergoing an echocardio, electrocardiogram or ECG. And these are the different leads that you can see on here and they'll be throughout the body. And so this is a normal sinus rhythm you can see there, okay? And so look at this guy. This is what's considered junctional rhythm. And you will see essentially or you should be able to see that the P wave is missing. So there should be a wave somewhere around in there that has a small hump getting ready. You can see it here in the regular and it's missing. So the P waves are absent in junctional rhythms. And the AV node paces the heart at about 40 to 60 beats per minute if you are not getting any depolarization of the SA node. Here, is a second degree heart block. And so here, if you notice, you have two, basically, or an extra P wave. Right? You have, once it's over, right there, you have your T wave but then you have a P wave, P wave. Or here, do you see how you have your T wave and just one P wave, right? And so this is basically your AV node fails to conduct all impulses.
ventricular fibrillation. Yeah, this is considered a heart attack. There, this electrical activity is completely disorganized. Action potentials are occurring randomly throughout the ventricles. It results in this, this chaotic, grossly abnormal ECG, and it's seen in acute heart attacks and after electrical shock. So yeah. So those are three um, basically comparing normal ECG tracings to abnormal. And so our next part of this lecture is going to be talking about um, heart or the mechanical events related to the heart. <laughs>